With the war in Ukraine raging, we might ask ourselves, why doesn't Russia lob a few missiles over at Poland? After all, they are the third largest provider of military aid to Ukraine. There's a very simple answer to that question. Poland is part of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Article 5 of the treaty states, the parties agree that an armed attack against one or more of them in Europe or North America shall be considered an attack against them all, and consequently they agree that if such an armed attack occurs, each of them, in exercise of the right of individual or collective self-defense recognized by Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations, will assist the party or parties so attacked by taking forthwith individually and in concert with the other parties such actions as it deems necessary, including the use of armed force to restore and maintain the security of the North Atlantic area. Any such armed attack and all measures taken as a result thereof shall immediately be reported to the Security Council. Such measures shall be terminated when the Security Council, Council has taken the measures necessary to restore and maintain international peace and security. In everyday language, this simply means an attack against one ally will be considered an attack against all, and the rest of the alliance will come to their defense. Given that three of the NATO countries are nuclear powers, this article carries a lot of weight, so Russia is wisely deciding it will lob insults rather than missiles at Poland. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization is an example of what's called a collective defense arrangement. There, these are sometimes referred to as agreements where an attack on one is an attack on all. NATO is one of seven such arrangements that the United States has with allies across the globe. What's interesting is that the vast majority of countries that are protected by these arrangements are democracies. Democracies that are not part of these collective defense arrangements must mostly fend for themselves. For example, three European countries, Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova, must contend with Russia occupying part of their countries. Ukraine and Georgia have expressed a desire to join NATO, but their disputed borders, and in the case of Ukraine, a war, make this impossible because of treaty rules. So, how many of the world's democracies are protected by collective defense arrangements with the United States? Let's start with the current state of global democracy. Which current countries in the world are democracies? There are several different ways to measure the quality of democracy. I'm going with the Freedom House definition because it's both widely used and because it categorizes every country into three convenient buckets free, partially free, and not free. There are some criticisms about Freedom House's methodology, but I think it's a good approximation to what most Americans would consider free, partially free, and not free societies. Here's what the world looks like according to Freedom House. Blue is free, purple is partially free, and red is not free. I'm using 2020, 2021 data, by the way. We see pretty obvious clusters of free countries in North and South America, Europe, East Asia, and Oceania. Adjacent to many of the free countries are ones that are partially free. I'm going to overlay the various U.S. collective defense arrangements in green. Let's start with NATO. Almost all of the free and even partially free countries of Europe are in NATO. The arrangement between the United States and Australia and New Zealand is the collective defense agreement that protects, as you may have already guessed, Australia and New Zealand. The Philippine Treaty covers the Philippines, the Southeast Asia Treaty covers Thailand, the Japanese Treaty takes care of Japan, as the Republic of Korea Treaty does South Korea, large swaths of Latin America are protected by the Rio Treaty. As you can see, there aren't so many blue areas left except for the southern tip of Africa and Mongolia, a free island surrounded by the Red Ocean that is Russia and China. It's not hard to see that most of the world's robust democracies are protected by a set of mutually beneficial alliances with the United States. All of these alliances were forged in the early days of the Cold War. Since the end of the Cold War in 1989, some people in the United States have begun to question the usefulness of our collective defense arrangements. 
What would it mean if the United States decided to take the isolationist route and remove itself from these alliances? Let's start by looking at the United States' military expenditures versus those of its allies. If we combine all the military expenditures by each unique country in all of the U.S. collective defense arrangements, it comes to only about two-thirds of what the United States spends. Put another way, if the United States withdrew from these alliances, the collective military expenditures of the alliances would drop from 1.6 trillion US dollars to 560 billion dollars. To give some perspective on the scale of the United States' military power, this graph shows the US military budget in comparison to the combined budgets of all countries outside the US collective defense arrangements. Bear in mind that this includes rivals like China and Russia. The United States spends more than all of these countries combined. If we consider the alliance's nuclear arsenals, there are just three countries with nuclear weapons, the United States, France, and the United Kingdom. While the United States has more than 5,000 nuclear warheads, France and England each have fewer than 300. France and the UK are both in NATO, so if the United States decided to withdraw from all of its alliances, there would be no nuclear umbrella to protect countries like Japan or South Korea. There are a couple of different conclusions you can draw from the facts I've just presented. One is that the United States is essential for the preservation of democracy around the world. Without it, there's nothing to stop many democratic countries from being invaded, especially by non-democratic ones. But there's a second conclusion that people have been drawing from the outsized role the United States plays in these alliances. That is, that the United States is doing more than its fair share, or that it gets nothing out of these arrangements, or that money spent on the military is better spent at home, or that these alliances have a tendency to destabilize the world in a way that leads to more bloodshed. Let's take the example of NATO. Many Americans, even those who support NATO, probably assume the alliance has never been tested or that it has never benefited the United States in any material way. The photograph you see here is one that I took outside my window on September 11, 2001. Looking at these photographs again, I remember the feelings of grief and rage that followed. On October 4, 2001, Article 5 was invoked for the first and only time. A total of eight separate actions were taken by NATO in response. The war in Afghanistan took the lives of 2,461 Americans. What many Americans don't know is that more than 1,000 NATO troops also died as a result of the war. Having seen the effects of the September 11th attacks firsthand, I am nothing short of grateful for the ultimate sacrifice that our allies made when our country was attacked. I think there's room for debate about how much we or any of our allies should invest in NATO. However, it's hard to argue that somehow NATO has become irrelevant with the end of the Cold War, especially since the only time Article 5 has been invoked was in 2001, long after the Cold War had ended. I'm also skeptical that NATO has destabilized the world, given that it is a purely defensive military alliance. But the talk about NATO has become increasingly extreme, despite the fact that according to the Pew Foundation, 67% of Americans viewed the alliance favorably in 2022. In July of 2023, Marjorie Taylor Greene called on Joe Biden to withdraw the U.S. from NATO because they were not a reliable partner. Joe Biden chose to disagree, saying that the U.S. would maintain its ironclad commitment to its allies. A group of Democratic and Republican senators have publicly declared their support for NATO expansion, and another bipartisan group in the Senate is trying to pass legislation that will make it impossible for a President of the United States to leave NATO without the Senate's consent. I hope this video has made clear the central role that the United States plays in preserving democracy at home and abroad.